1991, Sonic the Hedgehog burst onto the scene, forever changing the gaming landscape in the process. With its high-speed action and eye-popping visuals, Sonic helped rocket Sega's 16-bit console to the top of the charts. But there was something else on the horizon. Sonic CD remains one of the most divisive games in Sega's history. With a shift to shorter, exploration-focused levels, a new time travel gimmick, and a bold new design, Sonic's Mega CD outing remains an ambitious sidestep for the series. Thus, on this episode of DF Retro, we're exploring the design which defines Sonic CD, examining the ways in which it takes advantage of the Mega CD hardware, and we're checking out each of its ports. Is it still worth playing today? We'll answer all that and more on today's episode of DF Retro. Let's get started. As the curtain fell on 1991, Sega's future was positively gleaming. Sonic the Hedgehog was a critical and commercial success while the company's first CD-ROM system, the Mega CD, had just launched in Japan. Sega naturally wanted to capitalize on this by bringing the Speedy Blue Hedgehog to its new CD-based console. There was just one problem. Sonic Team had split into two. Yuji Naka, lead programmer and project manager on the original Sonic the Hedgehog, had grown unhappy with Sega management and left the company. Hearing the news, Mark Cerny reached out to Naka, and along with Hirokazu Yasuhara, the chief game designer on Sonic 1, convinced them to join Cerny's own Sega Technical Institute in the States. It's here where they would build a new Sonic team to create Sonic the Hedgehog 2 for Sega Genesis. The third key member of Sonic Team, however, character designer Naoto Oshima, opted to stay behind in Japan where he was tasked with bringing Sonic to the Mega CD. This project started with the intention of creating an enhanced port of the original game, but ultimately became its own unique project instead. Oshima was joined by Sega staffers with experience in such games such as The Revenge of Shinobi, Golden Axe 2, and Streets of Rage. This was a whole new team with its own unique vision, and that vision would come to fruition when Sonic CD was launched in 1993, two years after the original Sonic the Hedgehog. Looking at the finished product, I feel that Sonic CD is defined by three basic elements. Its control system, the core game design, and of course, its stylus presentation. Central to any great platform game then is its control. Sonic CD builds upon the foundation started in Sonic the Hedgehog, with the same responsive controls and excellent physics. Learning to control Sonic's momentum is key to fully enjoying the game, and it's a pleasure to master. New to this installment is the addition of the Spin Dash and the Peel Out. Sonic CD was in development parallel to Sonic 2 after all, and thus its Spin Dash implementation varies. Rather than the instant Spin Dash featured in the second game, Sonic CD requires a short charge-up period, which admittedly feels a little sluggish today. The Peel Out then is one of those features added for the sake of looking cool, I'd imagine. It rockets Sonic to top speed, complete with new animation work, but Unlike the Spin Dash, you take damage when running into an enemy and it's easier to lose momentum. A neat feature, but not essential. Perhaps the most important element in Sonic CD's design then lies in its progression system. At this point, the essence of what makes a Sonic game had yet to be fully defined, and thus Sonic CD feels wildly different. At first glance, it certainly looks the part, but if you dive beneath the surface, this is a very different game. In many ways, Sonic CD is to Sonic as Zelda 2 and the American version of Super Mario Bros. 2 are to their respective series. You see, while the original Sonic was sold on its high-speed gameplay, it was also packed with challenging platform sequences. With Sonic 2, Yuji Naka and his team leaned into the speed aspect of Sonic with faster, more focused stages. Finish each stage, conquer Eggman, win the game. Simple, but effective. Sonic CD, however, takes the alternate path, instead doubling down on platforming and exploration. Oh, and time travel. That's right, each of the game's seven zones now feature multiple time periods, the past, the present, 
and both a good and bad future. Your end goal here then is to make a good future by traveling back to the past, destroying Eggman's future polluting machines in each act, and well, there you go. But this is where things get interesting. Rather than simply running straight to the end of a stage, which of course is still possible, reaching the true ending requires a series of steps. When you first begin a stage, the first goal is to locate a time traveling sign plate. There are both future and past sign plates scattered around each stage, both of which allow you to jump to the respective time. Doing so requires you to reach a certain speed and maintain it long enough to initiate a time warp, a concept directly influenced by Oshima's love of Back to the Future. The first challenge then involves getting up enough speed to initiate the time warp, which kind of acts as a sort of puzzle mechanic in terms of level design. Once in the past then, it's time to find and destroy Eggman's robot machines, this is where exploration comes into play and where Sonic CD differs the most from other games in the series. Finding these machines is often challenging yet rewarding. These are large vertical stages with some of the most complex crisscrossing design the series would ever see. Now once you find and destroy this machine, a good future is created. And of course if you choose there are also metal Sonic projectors hidden in the past which, when destroyed, bring nature back to the present and future with lots of animals. At this point then, you can either finish the stage or take your time and warp all the way back to the beautiful new future you just created. If you do this on the first two acts of the stage then, the third act will take place in the good future. Fail to destroy those generators however and you get a bad future instead. Thus, the good ending requires making a good future in each zone of the game. It's this potent mix of time travel, exploration, and great control which helps create a memorable and rewarding experience here, and, and that's not even touching on things like the 3D bonus stages which we'll get to shortly. Now, the third and final element which helps define Sonic CD is its style. In designing the game, art director Hiroyuki Kawaguchi went all out. Each stage features a potent mix of vibrant colors and eye-popping designs. It's one of the most visually striking pixel art games of its era, I'd say. And this is paired with a remarkable soundtrack that perfectly encapsulates the sound of the 90s, at least in Japan and Europe. Infamously, Sega of America contracted out Spencer Nilsson to create a new soundtrack for the American release with its own unique style. While I'm more partial to the Japanese version myself, I've grown to love the US version over time, and hey, the US edition gave us Sonic Boom. Lastly, there are the gorgeous animated sequences produced by Toei Animation, which helped flesh out Sonic as a character while providing an actual ending to the game. These look awesome, even on the Sega CD with its limited color palette. Oh, and Sonic CD is where both Metal Sonic and Amy Rose were introduced, though the US manual refers to her as Princess Sally. It's also the first game to give Sonic a voice. Check it out. From controls, to game design, to its presentation, Sonic CD is a gem of a game even today, but as a premier game for a new platform, it also carried the responsibility of showing off the new hardware. Sonic CD's technology is as fascinating as its design, and if you break it down, it also manages to take advantage of every major hardware feature introduced with the Mega CD. Let's begin with the CD itself and the storage space made available as a result. Now it was common at the time for Sega CD games to feature CD audio soundtracks and a few FMV sequences, but that was often it. Sonic CD however takes advantage of the additional space to expand the complexity of the game itself. Let's consider Sonic the Hedgehog 2. This 16-bit cartridge utilizes an 8 megabit mask ROM chip. That's just one megabyte of data which is used to store the game code and artwork for the entire game. Each zone includes a single set of associated tiles, and much of its data uses the Nemesis compression method to reduce the amount of storage space needed. Now, excluding the video clips and CD audio tracks, Sonic CD weighs in at 21 megabytes, which translates to 168 mega power. This extra space enables a large variety of bespoke art assets to appear throughout the game, including multiple time periods per zone. 
Think about it, to support the time travel mechanic, designers created four unique, highly detailed tile sets for each zone in the game. That's basically four times the required storage space per zone compared to other Sonic games. Like those Mega Drive games though, Sonic CD uses the Nemesis compression system to store its artwork in 16x16 16 16 pixel block maps. But this isn't the only way that the extra storage space is used. Music is a huge part of Sonic CD, and the game features two distinct forms of audio playback. The bulk of the soundtrack is stored as streaming Redbook audio, which is played back directly from the CD, like so many other games on the system, and of course it sounds great. This, however, only applies to the present and future iterations of each zone. Rather than sticking with Redbook audio throughout, perhaps as a matter of disk space conservation, the past stages make use of Sega CD's Rico audio chip to play back PCM sampled tracks instead. While it's limited in terms of available memory at just 64 kilobytes, the Rico chip was used to great effect here. This is not simply a pre-recorded music track, this is sample-based music. Take a listen. Pretty nice, right? And fundamentally, music playback on the Super NES works similarly, but clearly the results here are of greater quality despite the same memory limitations. Sega CD can also combine its own audio capabilities with those of the Mega Drive hardware itself, creating a much larger number of available sound channels for developers to use, if they choose. Then we have the video playback. Full motion video was a big part of this generation, but Sonic CD makes smart use of its selected STM format, which basically provides a sort of uncompressed imagery directly to the video display processor. This is well suited for animation and produces results superior to the grainy Cinepak compression used in many other Sega CD titles. Lastly, there's the scaling and rotation. Sega CD's graphics processor offers hardware support for scaling of both tile maps and sprites, a step beyond Mode 7 on the Super NES, which could only scale background tile maps. This is used during the 3D bonus stages where Sonic is tasked with taking out UFOs in order to earn a time stone. Unfortunately, while the Sega CD supports these features, it isn't especially fast and thus the playfield updates at just 20 frames per second. The 2D backgrounds, however, are just standard Mega Drive layers and manage to move at a full 60 frames per second instead, creating a strange juxtaposition between the two. Unfortunately, this also brings to light an issue inherent to Sonic CD, and that is performance. For as beautiful as its visuals may be, the frame rate just is not where it needs to be, especially in comparison to the rest of the series. You see, Yuji Naka was primarily responsible for crafting the code which powers Sonic the Hedgehog in. He moved on to work on Sonic 2 after the first game, leaving the Sonic CD team with the original game as a base. And unfortunately, the code just isn't as well optimized as later Sonic games, and with all the new objects and features bolted onto Sonic CD, the frame rate suffers as a result, with regular drops throughout. Considering the quality of the artwork and concepts on display, it's a shame that the programming side of things falls short. So, despite these performance issues, Sonic CD remains one of the more accomplished Mega CD games released for the platform. It's a great showpiece title, but this was not its only home. Starting in 1995 and working its way up to 2011, Sega released Sonic CD across a huge number of different platforms. It may have seemed absent for quite some time, but I can assure you there have been many ways to play Sonic CD over the years. So let's begin with the first, the 1995 release of Sonic CD for Windows. There's a reason I specified 1995. You see, during this time frame, Sonic CD received two different releases on the PC, one in 1995 and the other in 96, and both of them for Windows 95. This was the era of Sega PC, an initiative to, well, bring Sega games to the PC platform, and Sonic CD is one of the first examples of this. 
The first version is known as Sonic CD Pentium Processor Edition, but online it's often referred to as the Dino 2D version, and it was only bundled with new PCs from companies like Packard Bell, rather than sold standalone in stores. But here's the thing, in the early 90s the PC platform wasn't exactly well suited to high speed scrolling games. Consoles were built with bespoke hardware designed to support smooth scrolling. You could define tiles, sprites, and palettes, and the hardware could quickly draw images to the screen according to the display list defined by the game code. The inclusion of these hardware registers allowed for smooth 60 frames per second scrolling in most console games, though obviously, unoptimized code can still exhibit issues as we see in Sonic CD. There are no equivalent hardware features available on the PC, and certainly nothing that could be used across a wide range of PC configurations. Instead, PC side-scrollers would need to draw graphics directly into a frame buffer, a process which was heavily limited by CPU speed and graphics card bandwidth. Some programmers found ways to improve performance in software, but even then, background graphics were generally simplified and requirements increased. It was very difficult to match the same smooth scrolling you could see on a console. For Sonic CD, however, Sega worked with Intel to develop libraries designed to allow faster scrolling with more complex graphics. Using this, you could bring console-style games to the system, a relative rarity at the time. The Pentium processor and mid-90s graphics cards were starting to become fast enough to power through a side-scrolling game like Sonic CD at an appropriate speed, however. But despite the special libraries and the higher requirements, the 1995 version of Sonic CD exhibits some noticeable flaws, which should have been obvious at this point. Primarily, scrolling is limited to just 30 frames per second, so while Mega CD suffers from plenty of slowdown, the PC version is locked at half the maximum frame rate. It's much less fluid. Secondly, genuine loading screens have been added between every stage and time warp sequence, which I always found somewhat distracting presentation-wise. On a faster Pentium though, this wasn't a huge problem, but slower machines exhibited seriously lengthy load times despite rarely accessing the hard disk, perhaps a side effect of its design. Then we have the animated sequences. The Mega CD version is basically an interpretation of the original Toei animation recreated as a series of frames designed specifically for the system's limited color palette. The frame rate is low, but it manages to avoid typical video artifacts of this era and looks pretty nice. On PC, however, Sega included the complete intro sequence as originally animated by Toei. With a higher frame rate and color depth, it provides our first look at the intro as it was originally drawn. Unfortunately, the video quality itself is really poor. It uses the Intel Indio 4 codec and exhibits some serious artifacting and dithering. A year later, Sega would include an even higher quality version of this intro on the Sonic Jam Disc for Sega Saturn. It's just a shame they didn't bring the game over as well. As for the bonus stages, the track itself still moves at just 20 frames per second like on Mega CD, but now the 2D backgrounds also update at a lower rate, another minor downgrade. For 1995, it was pretty cool to have Sonic on the PC, even if it did lack the fluidity of the original game. but things did improve the following year. You see, the Dino libraries were developed really before DirectX was a viable solution, but in 1996, DirectX 3 had arrived and offered decent performance. Thus, Sega released a new version of Sonic CD using DirectX, and this time, it was available at retail. This is the version I picked up back in the day, since I didn't own a Sega CD until years later, and I had only played that version at a friend's house. Now at first glance, it's almost exactly the same as the Dino 2D version, save for one major difference. Smooth Sonic Mode. If you were rocking a fast enough Pentium PC, like a Pentium 133, it was now possible to enjoy Sonic CD at 60 frames per second, or at least something reasonably close to it. When running on a decent PC though, the port feels faithful to Sonic CD, but I did run into occasional glitches like this, which I was unable to reproduce on the original hardware. The PC version also seems to make use of the American soundtrack in every single region. A tad disappointing if you ask me. Curiously, the Sonic & Knuckles collection, another Sega PC release, included a Sonic screensaver with the complete Japanese Sonic CD soundtrack available on the disc as low bitrate WAV files, which is how I first heard it. How curious.
Still, for 1996, the PC version of Sonic CD got the job done. The Sega CD was no longer a viable platform at that point and wasn't really widely adopted in the first place, so offering it on the PC allowed more players to enjoy it. Of course, this isn't the last time the PC version of Sonic CD would be rolled out. Years later, in 2005, Sega released the Sonic Gems collection for GameCube and the PlayStation 2, which included Sonic CD as one of its primary titles. It just so happens that this new conversion is based entirely on the PC port of the original game, which of course means that the loading screens are still present throughout the game, and some of the glitches can pop up from time to time as well. What's worse, the water in Tidal Tempest lacks color altogether. On Mega CD, a raster effect is used to change the palette below the water's surface, but even on the original PC version, this effect is properly represented. It's only this Gems Collection version which is completely lacking here, something that kind of robs the stage of its intended atmosphere. Worse still, if you play on the GameCube, and that's the only version released in the States, the game appears extremely blurry. The footage here is actually from the GameCube version using the 480p mode, but it's even worse when interlaced. So what's going on? Well, like many GameCube titles, a strong flicker filter is applied when interlaced and a different kind of filter is applied in 480p. Neither can be disabled and the results certainly aren't very good. Normally though, you can use a homebrew piece of software known as Swiss to force different video modes in many games, but unfortunately, it causes Sonic CD to crash, so we're stuck with this blurry image quality. The PS2 version, however, can produce much sharper visuals, but it was only released in Europe at 50Hz and in Japan. The Japanese version of Gems on both platforms does at least include the original Japanese soundtrack this time, though. The European and American releases, though, featured just the US soundtrack instead. At least the FMV quality is greatly enhanced this time. While it uses a composite video source, which results in visible dot crawl, the quality here is the best we had seen up to this point. You can really appreciate just how nice the animation is. Lastly, the bonus stages now run at a faster frame rate. We're looking at a full 30 frames per second now, and it feels much more responsive as a result. A nice improvement. Ultimately though, the GEMS version of Sonic CD isn't quite what I had hoped for at the time, with the PC loading screens and missing water effects, but really, it was probably the best way to play Sonic CD in 2005. The stages all play back at a perfect 60 frames per second, the bonus stages are smoother and the video clips are better than ever. At this point though, every version of Sonic CD released has its share of flaws. Thankfully, there's one last version to discuss and it's really something special. But first, it's time for the Digital Foundry Minute. Did you know, if you press down, 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 left, right, and A at the title screen of the game, you can enter a special sound test screen. From here, if you play FM track number 46, PCM track number 12, and DA track 25, you get this. Yes, the infamous spooky sonic screen. This bizarre image simply reads Tanoshisa Mugen, Sega Enterprises, Majinga, which basically means Infinite Fun, Sega Enterprises, Image by Majin. So what's up with this and who is Majin? Well, Clyde Mandolin theorized over on Legends of Localization, a site you should check out by the way, that Majin is a nickname for Masato Nishimura one of the game's artists, and he had hidden his name in other games, such as Shenmue, as well as Sonic CD here. Now, it's difficult to say with 100% certainty, but this theory sure seems to make a lot of sense. How bizarre. Now, back to the show. In 2009, a developer named Christian Whitehead released a teaser video online showing Sonic CD running on an old iPod Touch. In this video, he noted that this was not emulation of Sonic CD, rather, it was built using his proprietary retro engine. Looking back, this video arguably defined the future of Sonic. Sega would soon give Christian the chance to work on an official iOS version of Sonic CD, which would ultimately lead to so much more. This proof of concept, you could say, helped lay the groundwork for Sonic Mania. 
The retro engine powered version of Sonic CD then was released for multiple devices including iOS and Android phones, Apple TV, PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and the PC. And it's the best way to play Sonic CD today. For starters, the view has been expanded to fill the screen of its target platforms. Most versions deliver a full 16x9 view of the action, with no stretching. The visible playfield is simply expanded. Slowdown has also been eliminated completely and Sonic CD now delivers a perfect 60 frames per second across all of its supported platforms. Keep in mind that Christian shared this video back during the iPhone 3GS era, a time when high performance gaming on mobile devices was still rather uncommon. Oh, and the bonus stages? Yeah, they now operate at 60 frames per second as well, appearing more fluid than ever. Even better, both the American and Japanese soundtracks are included this time and selectable from the main menu. The one change here is that the Japanese vocal tracks lost those vocals because of licensing issues, but other than that, it's all here. Oh, and the video sequences are now presented at the highest quality we've seen yet and look fantastic. Even the gameplay receives some updates. The faster Sonic 2 style spin dash is now an option, and Tails can be unlocked as a playable character. Beyond that, a huge number of changes and tweaks were made to every single stage in the game. We couldn't possibly list them all here, but it all leads to an even better Sonic CD experience. Oh, and if you own the 360 version, it's playable on Xbox One via backwards compatibility. Unfortunately, things aren't quite perfect everywhere. The iOS version has been kept up to date and even offers a full ultra-wide display mode, which looks awesome on iPhone X. There's just one problem. It's broken. You see, once you reach this point in the stage, the game glitches out every single time. This has the potential to be an amazing version, but alas, on iPhone X at least, it's unplayable. Still, despite this oversight, most versions of this port are truly excellent and it is easily the best way to experience Sonic CD now. It's just a shame that we never received it on physical media. I would love to see Sonic CD and Christian's other retro engine ports appear on modern consoles in physical form. No matter how you choose to play Sonic CD though, it's still worth checking out today. It's a unique take on the Sonic formula from a very different era. It's experimental, stylish, and fun. But it's also one of those games that requires some playtime to truly get. I wasn't even a huge fan of the game originally, but once you start approaching it as an exploration-based Sonic game, it really comes into its own. And with that, we've come to the end of another episode. I hope you enjoyed this exploration of Sonic's unique Mega CD outing as much as I did, and if so, be sure to spread the word by liking, subscribing, and following me over on Twitter. And until next time, stay retro.